Okay, so um, yeah, I'm going to talk um, about uh, symmetries and graph neural networks, and maybe if time allows, about something about quantum mechanics. And all this uh, is joint work with my wonderful collaborators here. Um, and you will see them as we go through the various topics today. Um, so uh, the overview of the talk will be, um, I'll first say a few general words about generative versus discriminative machine learning. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about symmetries and equivariance. Um, then I'll talk about our latest equivariant graph neural networks. Um, I'll talk about then about uh, general things about Markov chain Monte Carlo. And then I'll talk about our latest MCMC algorithm based, it's a deterministic system based on divergence free vector fields. And then maybe if time allows, um, I'll be talking a little bit about quantum machine learning um, and the newly discovered Hinton particles in neural networks. And then um, I will conclude. Okay, so um, the general paradigm in machine learning um, or deep learning these days is basically a black box paradigm where you take on raw data and you try to predict properties of that data. Um, and that's nice because we've seen we can build very flexible models. Um, we are not so biased, you know, by actually imagining models that sort of describe the physics of the world, which are on the left hand side, which are the white box models. We've seen that they're highly accurate and we can use compute like GPU to make very fast predictions. Um, and we don't have to invert the model if we want to make predictions because the model is trained precisely in the direction that we want to use it. And on the other side is basically what the rest of science does, which is uh, what we would call white box models or generative models where we try to imagine how the world um, actually generates data. So the actual generating process so here we have two galaxies which are colliding under the laws of physics. So it's a physical simulation. It's very data efficient because the model uses actual expert knowledge, uh, like the laws of physics, for instance, and therefore has to use much, much fewer parameters. It's highly interpretable because the variables um, typically mean something. The variables and the edges in the, in the network, the interactions, they all mean something physical. And it's better at generalization, which is a slightly maybe more subtle point, which is because it uses the laws of nature and it because it uses causal structure in the world, these models tend to be much more robust if I would sort of change the domain. Um, and however, of course, we are sort of imposing a lot of inductive bias onto our models. And sometimes the world isn't precisely the way we imagine it. For instance, if you think about social interactions on, uh, on, on uh, social networks, that's probably very, very complicated process and, and all simple models are basically wrong. And so in there, in these domains, um, these the models on this side shine, where for instance, for the fundamental laws of physics, often these models shine. But I would argue we want something that's sort of in the middle. So again, here's a, sort of what a generative model is. Um, it's a model that simulates the data generating process. And before the deep learning sort of shift, uh, we were dealing with graphical models like these ones, and these are of the generative kind. And we wanted to do, for instance, inference in it. And I will talk about doing MCMC inference in these types of models. Um, but other, you know, scientists typically use simulators to encode their, their laws of physics or probabilistic programs. Uh, ordinary and partial differential equations, um, et cetera. Okay, so that's a generative models. Now what are discriminative models in a little bit more detail? I won't go into too much detail. Um, well, here's a CNN, uh, convolutional neural network, where you have an input image and you have a little filter. It's a bit hard to see maybe here, but here's your little filter. And you slide the filter over the image, uh, what we call a convolution. And then here is the filtered output image. And for every filter that you have, you create a new filtered image, and then you get sort of this feature stack. And then of course we do it again. Maybe first we uh, do some kind of pooling operation where we sort of only keep 
a subset of the pixels, maybe the typically the ones that have maximal excitation. And so we get sort of a pooled feature map and then we again um, convolve and we keep doing this until the very last layer where the feature maps are tiny, um, but you have very many of them. And then you train one single fully connected neural network to make your final predictions. So that's in the forward pass. And then in the backward pass, you would have to adapt, let's say, the pixels of this filter um, by, in such a way that your errors on your training set are going to go down. So you write down an objective function. You can put the gradient with respect to the objective with respect to a parameter that's here. And then there's some very efficient bookkeeping that you can do is to back propagate through this chain uh, to adapt these parameters using you know, stochastic gradient descent. Now, so that's um, typically when we have Euclidean data, simple data, and there's lots of it, um, you know, sequences or images. Um, and, but often the data is also not of that kind, um, of a simple Euclidean nature. Um, for instance, if it's on a sphere like the earth, like weather pat patterns on the earth are an example, or for instance, when they're in a graph, like a social interaction network. Um, and the sort of study, the, the field that studies deep learning on these, deep ty these types of data is called geometric deep learning. Um, so the machine learning of non-Euclidean domains. Um, and you know, there's things which we won't discuss all today, but a subset of them, we have graph neural networks, we have group neural networks, we have gauge convolutions, we have all these types of things to deal with these non-Euclidean domains. There's a vast amount of application areas uh, ranging from computer vision, you know, graphics, social networks, chemistry, very interesting applications these days in, in, in chemistry and material sciences, biology, drug design, physics, and uh, like a high energy physics, CERN, and, and medicine as well. Okay, so this talk will be, part of the talk will be about symmetries and equivariance. Um, now, what, what are symmetries and equivariance? They play a huge role in physics. Um, and um, in physics, basically, many of the laws have come about by reasoning about, you know, writing the laws in such a way that they transform what we call covariantly with respect to transformations of the observers. And, and that's what we call the symmetry, right? So if we have an observer and the observer is, you know, uh, you know is rotated, then of course the, the world for the view of that observer also rotates and you want to write down your equations such that they nicely transform under these kinds of uh, different reference frames. Um, for instance, uh, the field of electromagnetism was um, unified by Maxwell like, precisely by thinking about these types of transformations. Uh, the transformation there was called the Lorentz transformation where um, he figured out that you know, basically the magnetic field and the electric field were connected to each other um, by considering a observer that moves with respect to a sort of still observer. And in for the, the observer which would be standing still would interpret this as an electric field where the observer which would move by it with a certain speed would interpret that as a, as a magnetic field. And so we have a unified view. And Einstein of course went one step further still and said that, well, actually, um, you know, acceleration is equivalent and indistinguishable from, from gravity. And so if we equate these two things together, which we can again call a symmetry, um, but now under accelerated frames, not just speeding frames, um, then we get general uh, relativity. So it's a very powerful um, sort of framework paradigm. And in fact, um, you know, even the complete standard model is based around these symmetries. So here's U1, SU2, and SU3 symmetries to organize all the elementary particles sort of in the universe. Okay, so how are we going to use this idea of symmetries? Um, and um, the concept, the basic mathematical concept that we will need is called equivariance. And equivariance uh, is basically if we have some map X to Y, which would be a convolution in a neural net, and we have uh, two functions, which are the symmetry operators in X space and in Y space, right? And then we say that the function F is equivariant if first applying the symmetry transformation in X space, which would be something like, I have an image of a gecko and I translate it, um, then 
convolving it, which would be taking taking the image, the, the translated image, and then convolving it into this, should be the same as first convolving and then translating the convolved image. Now, in this case, these two operations are the same, but they don't need to be necessarily be the same. This could be another operator. Okay, so you would think, um, you know, for translations, this is fairly trivial, and you would you might suspect that in fact, for a uh, ordinary CNN that they are in fact uh, also equivariant under rotations, but then um, that's not true. So here you have an image and we rotate it and we basically have a fixed camera that sort of looks at it. And you can see that um, the camera, basically the, the feature maps here are changing as the camera is moving. So this, this of course is the reference frame where we move with the rotation of the camera. So we stabilize the image um, and you see it changes. Now, if you have something like an agrivariant neural network under rotations, it is much more stable or, you know, ideally completely invariant. And this was sort of, these, these images come from uh, this beautiful paper. Now, I don't want to go too deep um, into this topic today. I just want to tell you that very recently, uh, Mark Finzi, um, who is a student of uh, Andrew Wilson um, and, and at NYU, uh, and, and we collaborated on this beautiful project, um, and of course, Mark Finzi was the, the, the big brain here. Um, and um, so this paper that we wrote, or actually the software that's, that, be, that goes with it, basically says, well, the only thing that you have to provide to me is um, the generators of your group in a particular representation space. So you choose a particular vector space in which you want to represent um, you know, the, your, your data. And then, um, and then you have the generators of your group, which is typically a much smaller set of operators than all the elements of your group. For instance, for permutations, it's only sort of neighboring flips, neighboring permutations. Um, and you can do this both for continuous groups, like uh, Lie groups, or for finite groups, like C4, like the, the, the group of you know, orientations for four 90 degree rotations. You just give me those generators. You can then stick that into a very simple piece of software that's very efficient. And it will give you an equivariant basis of, of convolutional kernels for that group. So it's actually very simple. Once you have that basis, you just have to learn the parameters that multiply those filters. And then you're guaranteed that that neural network that only uses that basis or linear combinations of those bases uh, basis filters is going to be an equivariant neural network. So that, that makes this actually a very easy, you know, a step now, a low threshold step to sort of enter in this field and, and use these equivariant kernels. Okay, so, so that was sort of equivariance um, sort of on, on, on Euclidean spaces. Now we'll move to sort of these um, graph neural networks. And um, so, so if we think about a normal convolution as a graph neural net, that you can actually do that. So you can say, so what, what you know, what what does a convolution look like? So there's a center pixel which receives information from its neighbors, which is this patch here. And um, so each of the neighbors, there is a there is a feature stack here because we have m many feature maps. And so there's a vector here, and that vector gets multiplied by some kind of matrix, and gets moved to the central feature map, and then each one of these neighbors do it. They can use different set of matrices. Um, and then even you can send you know, a message to yourself, and then everything gets added up. And then the sum of those things maybe pushed through a nonlinearity is then the outcome of the convolution for one layer. So that has the feel of a message passing algorithm where each one of the neighbors sends a message to the central node. So um, when we started to think about graph convolutions, uh, Thomas Kipf um, sort of, no, maybe five or six years ago already. Um, so we sort of came to the problem that, well, it, on a graph, first of all, the number of neighbors can be different for every node, but also um, the ordering of the node is quite undefined, right? It could, it, I could have drawn this particular graph differently. I could have moved this node here and it would be exactly the same graph. But now if I would go through these nodes in sort of circular order, like I would do here, 
um, then I would have a different order. And so I would really want that if I don't have a canonical way of you know, writing down that graph, that whatever I do needs to become independent of that ordering of how I order my neighbors. And so one solution, which is not the most general solution turns out, but one solution is to use the same matrix for every one of these neighbors to send their message to the central node. So we use the same matrix here, W1, and there's another matrix for the message to yourself. And it turns out that that is actually then a, a proper sort of graph convolution in the sense that first of all, I can of course run it, but also if I permute two nodes, um, then, then sort of the, the, the label of two nodes, then at the outcome, whatever I do at the outcome is also going to be permuted. And um, so we can write this slightly more generally, which is a message passing neural net. So the, the, the more general framework is that I have some features A, I, J on an edge, which are fixed features. And then I have these sort of dynamic sort of latent variables H, these hidden, hidden states, one for node I and one of node J. I have a general sort of nonlinear function of say neural net that creates a message on an edge. So for every edge, I can compute this particular message. Then I can collect messages going into node HI by summing over all the neighbors. And then finally to update the state H, I take that message, I take maybe any other fixed feature, feature, node features, and I take that H state at that node and I push it again through some kind of nonlinear function like a neural net to create my new H. So this is a, a rather general formulation of a graph neural net. Okay, so the new thing that we did is we now took that idea of a graph neural net and now we made that equivariant under rotations. And the uh, motivation for this is that a lot of um, problems in, for instance, computer vision are formulated these days as point clouds. And you know, if you have a chair and you rotate the chair as a, as a bunch of points, then the chair is still a chair if it's rotated. But more so, um, I was personally very motivated and, and inspired to work on this because of molecules. And so obviously a, mole a molecule is also representable as a graph. And if you want to you know, predict properties of molecules, for instance, to see how well they bind to a particular other molecule and maybe predict how effective it would be as a, as a drug. Um, then also the, these properties are not dependent on how you have represented that molecule in, in, in its or in, and how it's oriented. Um, and so we want now to develop a graph neural net that's simple, fast, and um, has this property that if you rotate it around, it gets equivariant. And so this is kind of nicely sort of illustrated here. So here I have my little neural net. These X's are the actual 3D positions of the nodes. And then I have some invariant feature val values H, which will also transform, but they will not transform under, so they will transform as we move through the layers of the neural net, but they will not rotate. Um, they will not transform under rotations. All right, so now if I take this and I rotate it, so here's the rotated version of this, and then go through you know, a update of my graph neural net, that should be the same as first going through an update of my graph neural net. So the, the update actually changes, uh, you know, clearly not only these feature sets, but also moves, you know, these, these particles around. And then do my transformation, my rotation, these two things, this diagram should commute, right? Okay, so in, in more detail, I have a state which consists of uh, invariant features at nodes, um, our sort of position, you know, positions X for each node and actually also velocities for each nodes. I have features, which are just fixed features at nodes and at um, edges. And then um, the set of invariants um, that, that is changing in this model, but they are invariant under rotations are my H's. They are supposed not to transform under rotations. And of course I can also create this sort of distance between to you know the norm between xi and xj and clearly under rotation that also doesn't change. Okay, now the equivariant updates very much look like the message passing that I um, explained in the previous slide. Um, 
So you have a, so an, 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 a function of, of, of the features HI and HJ on both sides of an edge. And then of course this feature uh, value here on the edge. But now we also add this distance thing because this distance between XI and XJ is now also invariant. So MIJ is now nice and invariant. Then we update our velocity. So our velocity is gonna be some function, another function of HI times the velocity V um, plus the sum of XI minus XJ times another um, function of MIJ, which is this thing. And if you look closely, you can already see that these things are equivariant for the simple reason that everything you know, in phi's here are invariants and everything that is like vectors X and V here, they are simple vectors in 3D space. So these vectors all transform in exactly the same way. So this transforms as a vector and this is a scalar. Okay, so now I have the velocity, I add the velocity to X and now I can move my particles around, still a vector. I also collect all my messages over the edges and then I do another update to get my new H. So it isn't a really simple, extension of a graph neural net, but it is fully equivariant. And um, and it is simple because we just use these three dimensional vectors. And previously we have worked with much more complicated representations that used claps gordon coefficients and spherical harmonics and all these things. But it turns out that's actually not necessary, interestingly. Okay. This thing is not moving anymore. Can you still hear me? Yep, we hear you. Okay, it's moving again, fortunately. Okay, um, so um, yeah, so what we can do is we can sort of contrast the method that we just developed to all sorts of methods which were developed in the past. You know, here's the, G, the simple GNN which I explained. Here is the sort of the one that I explained as the sort of the equivariant one. Here's a bunch of other equivariants. One, this one is also EN equivariant, but it doesn't have this, this GNN part, right? The part which a normal graph neural network has, which actually is very important for, for good uh, performance, but it is, has this equivariance property. Here's the tensor field network and the one that we worked on the SC3 equivariant transformer, which has a sort of also an attention module in it. So um, also equivariant, but much more complex. Um, and there's also this model called the radial field. They all look a little bit the same. Of course, we wrote them as similar as possible in this table, but you can see that basically this represents the best of all worlds in the sense that it has the power of a GNN and it has the equivariance of these models here. Okay, some, some experiments then uh, for this part of the talk. Um, so one experiment you can do is, uh, you know, some particles that are sort of moving around that interact and you're trying to predict the future trajectories, um, you know, because you know, they, they're moving under some dynamics. Um, and, you know, we, we, inform, we implemented a whole bunch of um, you know, methods. And when I say we, of course, I mean Victor um, and, and Emil and not myself. Um, and, uh, you know, it actually for these types of problems, the improvement was actually quite strong. Right, so the equivariance really helps a lot relative to, for instance, a graph neural net. Um, and here you can see that nicely for the, you know, as a function of the number of samples, right? So if the number of samples is very small, you would expect that the graph neural net is not doing so well because it has a lot of parameters that it needs to learn and it doesn't have a good inductive bias. Um, so the radial field network doesn't have all that many parameters, but it has this equivariance. So it should be performing quite well. And of course, the, e, the, the EGNN um, sort of represents the best of both worlds in some sense. It has both the, the flexibility to improve when you get more samples, as well as having the right inductive bias to do well, even when the number of samples is small. Okay, so then we went to the next topic, which is a autoencoder. And so here you can imagine that sort of you take a molecule, you encode it in some latent space, and then, and then you're asked to decode to basically predict again back the edges of this molecule. Okay, so why is this useful? Well, the the encoder part is sort of like a neural net and you could imagine this from here, you can sort of predict sort of properties of a molecule. But the decoder part is a generative model of molecules, right? So you could imagine now a system where you say, okay, I want these properties of my molecule in this space. And then you sort of, would sort of set this, 
in terms of the latent variables. And then you can start to generate molecules which have that property, which you can then try out in a lab to see if they really have that property, right? So that was the inspiration to work on this particular part. It turns out it's actually a very complicated model problem. And the reason it's complicated is that um, if you embed something like this graph here, for every node, because there's, it's very symmetric, for every node, the graph looks exactly the same. Right, because it has two neighbors and there's something on the other side. So it's, it's perfectly symmetric. And so if you start to convolve on this thing, um, it will map to, a, to exactly the same point. Every node will map to exactly the same point because it's perfectly symmetric. Now people have done things like add noise to the positions of this thing or to the features of this thing. It and then you break the symmetry, so it works to some degree. But the model that we have breaks the symmetry in some sense naturally because we have these positions and we can just randomly initialize these positions. Um, and then you know we, we, nat we naturally break the symmetry and we can actually predict back sort of even these very symmetric graphs. Now the decoder, we picked something very simple in this case for, the, for these uh, problems uh, where we were just interested in, in predicting the edges. We were just seeing if the latent variables are close together, we're gonna have a higher probability of predicting an edge. Um, but of course, in the in the future, we can do something more sophisticated there. Okay, so for the auto auto encoding results, again, we compare it to a whole bunch of other things. So here's a couple of sort of uh, data sets on graphs where you can start to predict again the probability of an edge. And again, we can see a very fairly strong improvement over the existing methods that are out there. Um, and you can also see so this is the probability of an edge for uh, so I think for a particular set of graphs over very sparse graphs. The G and N model, the completely learned model was very poorly, probably because of the symmetry problem. And also for a very connected graph, symmetry pops up again and it's, it's already doing bad. And then these other model, you know, our model and the, the noise G and N actually do fairly well in this particular case. Um, and then the QM9 results, I said I was, I was inspired myself um, due to the, to the molecular application. So QM9 is a famous data set where a lot of these models get tried. Um, and so we also tried our luck on that. Um, so here's a whole bunch of properties that you can predict. Um, and here's, here's a whole bunch of um, sort of uh, state of the art methods that try to predict these properties. Um, one of the best one is LeConf here by Mark Finzi. And so, when, but, but what's interesting is our, our fairly simple model does surprisingly well on many of these metrics, right? And these improvements are, are fairly substantial, actually. There's only two where we were second best in the, in the prediction. Okay, so that sort of concludes the first part on, on uh, sort of symmetric graph neural nets. So that's sort of a, a discriminative method. Now I'll switch to actually a completely different topic, which is um, Markov chains. Now we're gonna think about generative models like a, like a graph, uh, graphical model. And so we're given the graph, we're giving all the potentials or the sort of conditional probability tables of that graphical model. And now we're going to try to infer, um, let's say the, 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 let's say the posterior of certain latent variables given other variables. Now, this is uh, the typical way to do, there's two sort of families of methods to do that with one is uh, sort of mean field type of variational methods. Um, and the other family is Markov chains. So we'll focus on Markov chains and this is work together with uh, Kirill and Roberto. Um, so the idea of, of a, you know, setting up a Markov chain um, is that we basically want to reach an equilibrium state that is equal to the target probability. And in the equilibrium state, the amount of probability that's flowing into any point should be similar, should be the same as the amount of probability that's flowing out of that point, because then the amount of probability isn't changing at that point, right? And in detailed balance, we basically enforce this between any pair of points, right? So we can take any pair of points and we're gonna say the probability that's being carried over this pipe here to this, to this point is the same as the probability that's carried over this pipe here to this, to this point. Um, and it, you, can, you can write the condition like this. So the probability of X times the probability of going from X to X t plus one is the same as starting as P X t plus one, probability of that, and then moving backward to X t. 
Now, detailed balance is best visualized as, as the diffusion. Um, and, and therefore, you can sort of imagine, you know, if you take a cup of tea and you drop some milk in it, it diffuses, but it's a very slow process. So the mixing is actually very slow. Um, yeah. Now, what we really want is something that looks much more like convection, right? So here's the earth mantle, and here is sort of the, you know, this, the lava streams that sort of move around um, inside the earth mantle, and that's convection. So now you can see that the mixing, if you follow any point, you know, the, the mixing is, is way faster. Of course, here it's only going in circles, but you know, you can imagine that it goes everywhere. Um, and so what we really want is what we call uh, an irreversible Markov chain. Now it's a, it's a bit of a bad name, I think, because it, it is, it's perfectly reversible, um, but it's just that the forward and the backward kernel are not the same. Okay, so what kind of condition do we, do we need to write down? in order for the more general system, right? So if we don't do detailed balance, what should we do then? But we, what should we at least demand? And what we're going to demand is invariance. So we're gonna say, I, I start from my P of X and then I transition using a stochastic kernel T to X prime given X, and then I integrate over X. And then, you know, per definition, that's going to be P prime X prime but I want that to be the same as P of X prime, right? So I want P to be invariant under that transformation. Now that detailed balance satisfies this, but it's not, it's not uh, necessary. Um, so you can think of this basically as some kind of symmetry of P because P remains invariant under that transformation and detailed balance in, in under detailed balance. Um, what we're gonna say is that the forward kernel going from X to X prime and the backward kernel from X prime to X is exactly the same kernel. And that's why we sort of call it, or well, where people call it reversible and sometimes because the forward and the backward kernel are the same. However, um, for irreversible kernels, you can always write something like this. So the, the, the backward, you can still write some kind of detailed balance condition if you want, but now the backward kernel is going to be different than the forward kernel. And you can show that, um, you know, if T is not equal to T prime, then T prime only exists or is normalized if and only if T leaves P invariant. So this condition is formally equivalent um, if T is a normalized you know, kernel, is formally equivalent to this condition. Um, and now we will take another sort of step. So we now have some process that you know, can go. So, so, so this basically means that we, when we move under T, you know, under T then if we want to go back, we should use T prime, but we're not, we're gonna use T again, right? And so that means that, you know, now we are going to flow into circles here. And we're gonna take another special case, which is uh, we're gonna get rid of the randomness. We're gonna take deterministic kernels. So we're gonna say this, this transition kernel X prime given X is actually a Delta peak at X prime minus FX. And of course I have to figure out what F is still in order to make the whole thing sample correctly. Now, what is the intuition for a deterministic irreversible kernel um, to be a proper kernel to leave the target distribution invariant? Well, we have to go back to our vector algebra for that. Um, calculus, actually vector calculus, I think it's called. Um, and it's basically stating that the amount of stuff flowing into an area has to be equal to the amount of stuff floating out of that area, right? Because that you can imagine at equilibrium, that's what you want, because then the amount of probability stuff inside this circle um, is going to stay the same. And basically what you need is Gauss divergence theorem, which says that the amount of stuff flowing in and out of a system is basically a surface integral over this uh, sort of this, this, this object here of the inner product of that, you know, the, the, of that on that surface times the vector field F, which are all these arrows here, and then integrate over this, um, you know, over the surface. So that's telling you that the amount of stuff going out and the amount of stuff going in is the same. But you can rewrite that according to this Gauss divergence theorem into the volume integral of the whole thing inside of the divergence of F. Okay, so what we're basically going to now say is that if we can find a vector field that is divergence free, then we're gonna be guaranteed that this is, uh, you know, that, that that's the proper way to evolve our vector field. 
our, our samples. Now, it turns out that's exactly equivalent to the continuity or Liouville equation, which basically says that the change in probability density, P, is going to be equal to the minus of the divergence of some you know, uh, probability uh, field. Uh, well, yeah, the, the, the flow, say probability flow. Right, so I, I need to find a prob you know a probability flow vector field that has that is divergence free, and then I can make it invariant. Okay, so basically what we're going to be interested in actually, and, and you know, there's, there's a couple of steps of derivation, is we want to create some ODE for points X particles that we're going to evolve, such that um, these particles, as we, as we evolve them according to that ODE. Uh, will distribute according to p, and it turns out that if you write down the, the, the you know the, the derivative dx dt, which is you know the, 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 the how, how x is going to move, is equal to this vector field v, v, and we're going to say that v um, is going to be equal to j divided by p, and we want that j has divergence zero, right? So we want this here to be zero, so divergence is zero. But you know, after some little bit of calculation, you find that that means that we have to evolve our particles according to j divided by p. Okay, and the proof basically comes from the you know from the Gauss law um, in some sense. And um, yeah, and so we can sort of the way I tend to think about this is that we find sort of transformations of x such that the density remains invariant. And so you can sort of think of those as, as symmetries of your space, of your density. Um, okay, so, so the particular one that we studied um, is what's called dynamical Gibbs sampling. So there, the vector field that we're going to use to, for our ODE is given by um, you know, C divided by the conditional distribution P of Xi given X not I. So, so this is the conditional probability distribution and um, Okay, so so uh, if you use this particular, uh, you know, update, and there was a paper a long time ago by Suzuki um, that sort of already proposed this, but he couldn't prove that that was actually uh, going to give you an in invariant measure. Um, if you choose this particular velocity field, then it's very easy to show that divergence of p times v is going to be zero, because p times this thing, if you use Bayes' law, then you get you know. P divided by P, and then here's P, you know, you know X not I, so only I excluded. But since X, since this doesn't depend on XI, all the, the derivative with respect to XI is going to be zero, right? And so, so this is a clearly a viable option to use. And if you use it, and of course we have to, you know, what we did is actually we extended this to discrete uh, setup. So we uh, we basically said, well, what if your space is now sort of uh, d divided into little cells, and in and we put sort of constant probability inside these cells, proportional to the probability of that state, that discrete state, um, and you have to sort of prove the you know the extension of the sort of the divergence theorem, etc., to that particular case. Um, but then you can sh find out that that's actually still valid. And here you can see if here's my probability mass on a torus, and you can see that so th this is the ODE as it sort of iterates over this space, and it sort of you can see that it will, uh, you know, stay longer at these positions, but also um, it will it will actually th there's also a weight because it, it will move slower in this place, so it will go very fast in these places, but it will very, move very slow in this space. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so of course we have to worry a lot about ergodicity, um, but we can show that if it's ergo ergodic and if for special cases you can show that, um, then it's uh, then it's going to be sampling correctly. Um, yeah, and of course the you know and, and the ergodicity has to do now basically with uh, chaos theory, so the theory of nonlinear dynamical systems. So here you can sort of see a map that sort of very quickly mixes the points around. Um, but you know, proving ergodicity is not necessarily easy for these systems. Okay, here's some results. Um, target distribution is an image of uh, Gibbs, and uh, the sort of every pixel is now a particular state, and uh, the the gray value is the probability of that state. 
Um, so here is the one over t convergence, which you typically never get, even if not, if, even not if you have independent samples. Then you'll get a one over square root of t convergence, which is also what you see here, which is the one over square root convergence. So the, the dynamical Gibbs is interesting. It, it's first going slow because it's sort of going sort of much more sort of deterministic, but then at some point it picks up on this one over t convergence, and um, this is quite. Uh, you see this quite often that the convergence of these deterministic samples can go to one over t instead of one over square root of t. Here's another one for the Ising model. So we did some experiments on the Ising model. And also here you can see the log probability goes up very fast. And, uh, and you know, the estimation error for certain averages that we compute comes down faster than Gibbs and, and some other HMC algorithm that we implemented. Um, yeah, here's some other results that I'll just skip for now. Um, and in the last sort of uh, seven minutes, um, I want to talk a little bit about some other stuff. Um, so here we were studying the problem of, um, you know, let's say an image, but now the image does not have a very nice regular grid, but might have a very sort of irregular grid, like like super pixels. And then the question becomes, um, how would we properly, you know, describe? It's it's similar to the graph problem. So how would we you know, come up with a, you know, a formulation of a deep neural net that would still work fine if we would now change this setup, the different super pixels or we remove some super pixels or, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a different graph. Um, and also that if we move one of these dots around a little bit, that the result is also changing uh, sort of continuously. And you can write that as a very nice PDE. So first, let's let's write down a PDE. So the PDE is a you know function f, which is our our sort of our, our feature field that we're going to produce uh, inside a neural net, and the DDT is we evolve it over time, so through the layers of a neural net, and then the D hat is some operator that we will need to design, um, and what we chose here is um, um, basically a linear term plus a quadratic term. And so the linear term is what usually is similar to a convolution and the quadratic term is an extra term which, which creates a sort of a diffusion, right? And then you basically formally solve the PDE and sort of evolve this whole thing forward. Now, um, I won't go into details because I don't, also don't have the time, but basically on the input, what we do is we, we have sort of our, so these points you can think of as the, as the pixels and we then fit a Gaussian process to those points. So now we have sort of a continuous line and an uncertainty. So now we have a continuous function. Now we can evolve our PDE, both on the mean and the kernel of that uh, of these two functions. And you know we have a we have a nonlinearity and some other stuff. And then we evolve and back propagate through this whole thing to make predictions. Right now here we can, we, you know, if we move these pixels around you know, because of the GP, nothing nothing will happen. And inside this, these are all GPs. We can even even optimize over the positions of these points, right? So we can remove points, we can add points, we can we can move them around, we can optimize what are the best positions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so we, we call this sort of probabilistic numeric CNNs because we, you know we, we, the, the Gaussian process helps us with the probabilistic integration of the PDE. Now, um, very briefly, um, if you're familiar with quantum mechanics, in quantum mechanics we also solve a very similar uh, sort of PDE and the PDE in this case is the Schrodinger equation. Now there is difference, of course, because there's an I here which is different, the imaginary number, and then H bar is of course also different. But otherwise, it looks very similar. H is also an operator with all sorts of derivatives, and it's a similar first order um, sort of PDE. Um, and um, you know the, the equation also looks formally the same. Um, you know, here's the other one that I discussed. Um, but this is actually, I mean, it's nice certain equation, but it's actually not what we want because under this paradigm, it turns out that the absolute value squared um, of that wave function is interpreted in quantum mechanics as the probability that you find a particle at any one of these points, right? But that's not really what we have. What we really have is like a whole field, right? We have points everywhere, which is like an image, and they have all values. It's not like there's a particle somewhere and I don't know where it is. And uh, you know, if I measure it, it, it sort of shows up somewhere, right? So we really need fields, not just quantum mechanics. So we really need quantum field theory. Okay, and that's what we did. And I'm not gonna um, sort of explain it too much. The paper will be on archive very soon. 
Um, the, the, I'm quite proud of the title, The Hintons in Your Neural Net, a Quantum Field Theory View of Deep Learning. It's a very natural map of a neural network onto a quantum field theory. And, and because it's a very natural map, you can basically do your, you know, you, you can create, you can look for the particles that the quantum field theory would also have. And of course they show up and, um, and we, uh, we, we called them Hintons um, for obvious reasons. And why this is exciting, except, you know, you can just think of this as a sort of a sort of exotic model, but the, but the exciting part is that you can actually implement this model on an optical computer. So this is a very nice fit to, you know, implementing this neural network into an optical computer. And so we described this in the paper. Um, and so that's where I see the future, this language of optical computing and um, for neural networks is, is basically exactly the same as this quantum field theory description of a neural net. Okay, so um, I'm going to conclude, I have two minutes left. Um, so first of all, I mean, at a very high level, machine learning is nothing else as inductive biases plus data. And it's in many ways, generative models are the best way to infuse these inductive biases into our model. But you know they're typically slow when you want to compute the things that you're interested in because you have to, to inverse invert that model, and they're also limited in their capacity, which means that um, you know that they often don't work as well as, as discriminative models. Now, if you're going for discriminative models, you still want to infuse inductive biases, and one way to do that is by using uh, sort of equivariance. And so we've shown equivariance in basically all sorts of models not just images, but also on spheres and on now also on graphs. So in this paper, I also discussed, or this talk, I also discussed the EN uh, equivariant graph neural network for sort of Euclidean transformations um, in, you know, in space. Um, and um, I'm very excited myself about applications in computational chemistry and drug design, among other things. I think this, this field is taking off fast and these models are gonna be very useful there. Then I talked about MCMC algorithms. Um, it's, a, it's a classic algorithm for uh, you know, inference and generative models. And we have this sort of interesting connection to chaos theory um, and deterministic systems that shows that you can actually do MCMC uh, using by designing these deterministic ODEs and that in fact often they have better convergence properties than random sampling even better than completely getting in completely independent samples which is better than any MCMC algorithm or it's sort of the holy grail of MCMC that, that would give you one over square root of n we get one over n often convergence um, so um, and then I finally said something about you can think of a CNN as solving a PDE plus some nonlinearities. This should be plus nonlinearities. Um, and then I finally ended with sort of a, a, a rather vague statement, but hopefully it will excite you and, and you, you take the time to read the paper, um, is that we can formulate deep learning as a quantum field theory. And of course, you know, you then can actually extend it into the quantum domain. Um, and if you do that, then it you, it is an algorithm. It's, a, it's the ex natural extension of a deep learning model on a optical quantum computer. And uh, with that, um, I, uh, I, I will end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Max. Let's see if folks have some questions. Thank you. Is, is that a quantum field theory paper on archive already? Um, it's is ready to go, but it's uh, we are still um, talking to Qualcomm precisely when we can release it. Oh, interesting. So this is with work with Qualcomm. Yeah. So this is uh, Blue Sky Research here within the Qualcomm AI Research uh, Lab. Yes.
Do people have any questions? Maybe Sorry. I have one question if I can ask about uh, the irreversible MCMC sampler. Uh, I didn't understand to what extent, because I would say that one of the big flexibility of the Gibbs sampling is that uh, once you define your full conditional, you have kind of a guarantee that you're going to converge to the invariant measure. Uh, I was wondering, this invariant MCMC sampler, to what extent uh, the transition and the proof to of ergodicity got to be customized to the application or whether there is some generality of, uh, of this type of kernel that once you follow a certain set of rules, you are guaranteed to converge to your desired target stationary distribution? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, so um, as long as the vector field, so you have to create a vector field basically. Mm -hmm. Um, v and as long as that vector field is divergence, well, a p uh, so v divided by p is going to be divergence free, um, or sorry, p times v is going to be divergence free. Then you are guaranteed that a if you follow the contours of that ODE, that it that leaves the the density invariant. So in other words, if you're if you are at uh, you know the target distribution and then you flow under that vector field, you will remain invariant. Now, the, the theory of MCMC says that if you have that conditioned and you have ergodicity, then if you start with an arbitrary distribution and you flow, you will eventually converge to the target distribution. But the trick is ergodicity. And ergodicity is a lot easier to prove for a stochastic kernel where you sort of, uh, you know, takes the, because you can sort of argue that if you have a Gaussian kernel, then there is a finite probability of, of jumping anywhere in space. And so that that's ergodic. Um, but if you do deterministic steps, then that's much harder, right? So because you can just come, so you're going over a trajectory and that trajectory could end up being periodic. And if it's periodic, then you haven't basically gone through all of space. Um, in a continuous setting, which means that at that point, you basically, you, you're not ergodic. So this ergodicity, you know, but you, you can do good guesses to be ergodic. Um, and, and that has to do with, you have to choose some of these parameters, these C's which I had in that, um, in that, in the definition of the vector field, they have to be, uh, sort of you know irrational numbers so if they are rational numbers then you can show that, that you you'll have eventually periodic uh, sort of movement but if they're irrational or prime numbers then they will not never you know get back to to themselves so so you can make some progress for some models but it you know this is the field of you know chaos theory um and you know just proving ergodicity or even the the measure for uh, for these arbitrary dynamical systems is, is certainly not trivial. I see, thanks. There was another thanks. question on the chat. Um, uh, is there a proof that these convective models convert faster than diffusive ones? And what kinds of graphs does this hold true for? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't think there's a general proof um, that for any situation, you know, the, the irreducible kernel is faster than the reversible kernel. Um, but it is, I mean, there, there, actually there are some papers that basically prove some things like that under some conditions. And I, you know, I don't know precisely now at the, from the top of my head, which papers there are, but there's certainly results um, that show that irreversible kernels will mix faster than reversible kernels. But precisely the conditions, um, I, I don't know. But that's that's just reversible versus irreversible, right? They can, that's still stochastic. Um, here we look at the subset even of that, which is deterministic. And then you get basically a nonlinear dynamical system theory. And there the results are probably even, even harder to get the proofs. Although there's a huge amount of literature, of course, on it.